did that prayer feel like it went all over the place? Isn't it good to know that Jesus tells us in the scriptures that tells his disciples and he tells us through his disciples that he's going to ask the Father to send a counselor, to send that Holy Spirit to make sense of what I don't make sense of. To make sense of things that we just don't understand. And it always amazes me that as I was thinking about this message and preparing, just feeling so inadequate to be able to to bring God's word that uh, he always does. Normally in a different way than I think it's going to go. And sometimes our prayer life is that way. We feel like we're all, it's all jumbled up. Doesn't make sense. But the Holy Spirit knows where that came from and that's what he lifts to our Heavenly Father and presents to him. The other day, I was thinking about this series of messages that we're in called Soul Music. And it it hit me that God loves music. Now, that's not earth-shattering, breaking news uh, there. But think about it. The only art form, we'll just call it, that we will take to heaven is music. In the scriptures, we don't read about when we get there, we're going to write or be reading books. Doesn't mention anything about cooking meals, about remodeling your house or whatever. We don't read about painting or drawing pictures or chiseling on a boulder to express ourselves. We don't read about growing a garden landscaping our yards. We don't even read about going to a flea market, yard sales, and second-hand stores, buying other people's stuff, castaway stuff. We don't read about that. We don't read about Etsy being anything where you're going to go and sell what you make other person's stuff into for a profit. We don't read anything about that. We don't read anything about building a, making a YouTube video that goes viral in heaven. We don't uh, read about us putting together whatever they call their actual term, a must-have app for your phone, the newest and the greatest. And sad to say, we don't even read about there being a fully equipped wood shop in the backyard. Just a place where you can go to express yourself with the creations of the wood or just to waste time. We don't read any of that. And with saying all of that, I don't know what we'll be doing in heaven. I don't know what will be going on, but the scriptures are clear that the heaven that heaven is going to be full of music. Full of music. Many times you've probably read of people that have been operated on and had had an out of body experience and so forth. My dad had one too. Where what dad talked about was just going there in the beautiful, beautiful music. And others that have written books about their experiences have said the same thing. The beautiful music that heaven is filled with. Of all the arts and the, the crafts that humans have 
learned and developed over the years, the only one that we're told is going to be in heaven is music. Thus, soul music. What is that? It's music that speaks to the heart, speaks to the soul, and it speaks to the spirit. What we've looked at already in this series, we've, we've talked about a song for yesterday. We looked at Psalms 32 in that, that dealed with our past and, and forgiveness of what is back there and how in that forgiveness Jesus has provided that our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west, removed from us. We've talked about song for today, last week, in Psalms 3. Helps us face whatever problems we're facing right now to say that, to stop, to pause, to think, and let the Holy Spirit remind you how great God is and how he has watched over and taken care of you. And today we're going to be talking about a song for tomorrow. Or for tomorrow. We're going to be looking at the very first psalm, Psalms 1, with this. And it's going to teach us in how to approach our tomorrows. How to make sure that if we live another day, how to make sure that our tomorrows are successful. That word success might be a, <laughs> very well be one of the most misused, maybe abused words that we know. What the world calls success is not necessarily what success is. Here in Psalms 1, the writer is going to show us the way to get God-given success. Success that outlives your life here on, or on earth. True success makes you not only emotionally happy, it makes you eternally happy. The first four words of Psalms 1 says, Blessed is the one. Another translation says, how happy is the man. The psalmist right away, Psalms 1, the first four words is telling us what all of these 157 psalms, <laughs> what, however many there are, what they're all going to be talking about. Not just Psalms 1, but all of them. Blessed is the one. So the psalmist is laying out here, starting right out, and he's telling you, this is God's blueprint for success. Notice here that the word blessed, blessed, sorry, is plural. It's, you were blessed yesterday, you were blessed today, and you were going to continue being blessed tomorrow, multiple times. That's what awaits us as we follow and trust him. That Hebrew word blessing is synonymous with the word success. God wants us to be successful. Psalms 35, 27 in the NIV says, des describes God as delighting in the well-being of his servant. In King James, it says, hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And the New American Standard says, who delights in the prosperity of his servants. In the New Living Translation, who delights in blessing his servants. What pleasures God? What delights him? Blessing us. Success, prosperity, however you describe that word, define that word. God, just as a good father, has the desire for his children to be successful. Which prepares us then for our tomorrows. 
The psalmist here tells us exactly in Psalms 1 how to do that. The first step is stay away from bad company. Psalms 1, 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, the sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I love the way the, the message translation states this. How well God must like you. You don't hang out at sin saloon. You don't slink along dead end road. You don't go to smart mouth college. I think that should have been smart mouth you. That just kind of flows a little bit better there. But the psalmist here describes three groups of people for us to stay away from, to, to avoid. It's the skeptic, the sinner, and the scornful. Now, they might all start with S, but they're all different. The skeptic is a person who hangs out at Sin Saloon, walks in the way of the wicked. In the King James, this kind of a person is referred to as the ungodly. The word ungodly literally means wicked. We might think of wicked people as people that are murderers or thieves or liars. But wicked people can also wear the latest fashions. They can go to church every week. They can give money to charities. But it's just uh, an exterior show for their own agendas that they have to benefit themselves. We hear Jesus describing the Pharisees in this kind of way in Matthew 23. The whole chapter is a woe to you Pharisees, to you teachers. But specifically, it, it says, woe to you teachers in the, of the law and the Pharisees. And he calls them you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. Then when you move from the, the skeptic, you get to the sinners. Sinner is a slink, long, dead-end roads. It's they stand in the way that sinners take. The wicked person is ungodly. The sinner is unholy. The sinner is someone who not only lives as if there were no God, but he knows he lives that way and it doesn't bother him. Hollywood's a pretty good picture of this in just how much they flaunt uh, sexual behavior, both in their movies and in their lifestyles. And they even brag on it. Kind of reminds you of Proverbs 30, verse 20, that says, Equally amazed is how an adulterous woman can satisfy her sexual appetite, shrug her shoulders, and then say, What's wrong with that? Pretty good picture of Hollywood and our society. And finally, we will come to the scornful, go to smart mouth college, sits in the company of mockers. Uh, English Standard and King James have the word scoffer there. This person is an unruly person. I found this kind of amazing in investigating that word, unruly. It is uh, actually refers to a dog snarl. Uh, it literally means to make a face at. I was kind of reminded of this this week, and you've heard that we got a stray cat that has had kittens at our place, and they have adopted my shop and my junk pile and, and so forth. And I've been feeding them every morning, and, and one of them that Thursday evening, I guess it was, and as I was taking the food out, it looked up at me and he just hissed at me. And uh, I'm bringing you food. What's the matter with you? And I just kind of back at it. And it took off running. 
That's that ugly face. That's the dog snarl. That is unruly. A good description of that. Proverbs calls this person a mocker, calls him a fool. If you want to be successful, you've got to stay away from these kind of people, this bad company, which they represent a lot of the people that we are around. Don't listen to their counsel. Think about it. Why would you listen to a world that is full of sin? Why would you listen to them advising you on how to deal with sin? Reminds me of a story that I read a while back. It was like a man who had a sick mule. And he knew that his neighbor had had a sick mule. And so he went to his neighbor and he said, Sam, my mule is sick. When your mule got sick, what did you do? And the neighbor said, I gave him a quart of kerosene. So the man went home and gave his mule a quart of kerosene. And the mule died. So, of course, he went back to his neighbor and said, Sam, didn't you tell me to give my mule a quart of kerosene? And Sam said, yes, I did. This man said, I did, and my mule died. And the neighbor said, don't feel bad. Mine did too. There are people that are dead. There are people in prison. There are people that are financially, emotionally, and physically a wreck simply because there are people that have dead mules (laughs) simply because they listen to the wrong crowd. Here in Psalms 1, we are told not to step with, stand with, or sit with bad company. Basically, don't hang around them. How do you do that? What happens when you do that? First, what happens is you take their advice, then you imitate their actions, and then you adopt their attitudes. What the psalmist is doing here is simply telling us the best way to deal with a potential problem is to stay away from it. The second way that Psalms 1 tells us to be successful with our life is to study God's Word. The Bible teaches that God blesses a person directly in proportion to their relationship to him with his word. Here is a person who God blesses with a type of success that outlives their earthly life. Looking at Psalms 1 verse 2. But those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The word delight literally means pleasure. When you are close to God, nothing will give you more pleasure than reading the Word of God. Listen to how David describes this hunger for God's Word in Psalms 119. This is going to be from the message paraphrase. In verse 14, I delight more in you in what you tell me about living in your Word than in gathering piles of riches. Verse 72, truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. Verse 97, oh, how I love all you've revealed. I reverently ponder it all the day long. And I love this one, verse 103. Your words are are so choice, so tasty, I prefer them to the best home cooking. Do you have that same kind of delight? Do you have that same kind of desire, dedication, devotion to God's word? Notice here in Psalms 2, 1, verse 2, it's not enough just to read the word of God, but we're told to meditate on it laws day and night. There is more to the Bible than just reading it or even studying it. We are to meditate on it. That word meditate, it literally means to speak to yourself. It's kind of like 
humming to yourself. You ever had that happen to you where you get up in the morning and there's a song playing on the radio or in the house somewhere and it gets stuck in your head and you can't get it out and you find yourself humming that melody long and even later on in the day without even realizing it, you are humming that melody in your mind. This is the same as meditating on God's word. It just is there. It penetrates you and it is active in in your mind. For some, reading the Bible is just another thing to check off of their to-do list, to do the good things that you're supposed to do every day. I mean, after all, we are Christian and that's what Christians do, right? You read the Bible. But then we walk away from it doing our own thing and we forget what we have just read. Success is tied deeply to God's word and it's not enough just to stay away from bad company. We must also study, meditate, let it be his word be active in our lives. Thirdly, we need to stand for what is right. When you do the the first two of these, here's what it will be. You will be like in verse three. That person is like, or other versions say, will be like a tree by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prosper. Excuse me. Why does a psalmist compare successful people here to trees? Think about it. A healthy tree stands firm because they of what their roots are planted in. The amplified version of this verse says that he will be like a tree firmly planted and fed by streams of water. Actually, the Hebrew word here for planted means to be transplanted. When you are transplanted by God from this world, he plants you beside the rivers of his truth. Where do you find that? In his word. Which makes you then unshakable in your belief. Therefore, you are unwavering in how you behave, no matter how violent the storms around you might be. You stand firm. When you stand in the word of God, it doesn't matter what anybody else says or what anybody else believes. Godly people are not guided by polls, by so-called experts, or by the public like ungodly people are. They are guided by the principles based upon God's word, the godly people are. A tree who bears fruit, verse 3, in season, every life bears fruit. But there are only two kinds of fruit-bearing trees in this world. Trees that bear ripe fruit, trees that bear rotten fruit. That is why we read then in verses 4 and 5, oops, sorry, not so the wicked. They are like chaff, like the wind that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Threshing floors. It's the place where they separate the grain from the chaff normally located on a hillside, sometimes in a well when you're hiding. We've read about that. But they normally have them on a hill where the wind will be blowing, where the breeze will catch it. The grain is harvested and they brought there and they have their devices, a club that has a rope in between that they beat the, 
the, uh, the harvested wheat, whatever kind of grain it is, and it separates the chaff from the seed, and they throw it up in the air, and the breeze blows the chaff away. And what is left is the good fruit, the good grain. What happens to the chaff? Well, it's normally gathered up and it's just burned. It's good for nothing. A truly successful person will bear fruit. I mean, that's clear throughout Scripture. Just one that, that jumped out at me was John fifteen six, where Jesus says, You do not choose me, but I choose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Finally, the truly successful person will bear fruit that remains fresh because this tree is planted by the waters. Its leaves do not wither. Here is a tree that is always green. Its roots are planted firmly in the fertile soil. It gets all the nourishment that it needs and its leaves are fruitful. That is why God wants us to be fruitful in the right season and fresh in all seasons. There is a college in the Midwest where there was a large oak tree that was central to, to on the campus and the campus had become known for this large oak tree. Uh, many a student had spread out a blanket underneath of that tree in its shade and enjoyed it and uh, joined conversations and it just became a gathering place for many, many, many students. Well, there was one day that there was a loud crack that was heard throughout the campus and this tree had fallen over, this giant oak tree. When they dis examined it, they discovered that it was diseased and this disease had been growing inside of this massive tree and this tree was basically just the outer shell. Outer shell. It was completely hollow. And so it didn't really take much of a wind to topple it over. This describes the vast majority of the people in this world today, even within the church. On the outside, they look happy, and in many ways they are. They look successful, at least by worldly standards, they look successful. They look healthy, and many of them are physically healthy. But spiritually, on the inside, they are as hollow as that big old tree, making them weak and unusable, like the chaff that is blown away in the wind. All they're good for is firewood. Verse 6 tells us, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction, to firewood. Our song for tomorrow is a song that gives us hope. For tomorrow, hope for tomorrow, because we are blessed today. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. That's what you experience today that equips you for tomorrow and the successes that are there. It is the Lord, his promises to watch over us, all of our tomorrows, that blesses us today and blesses us tomorrow. And that is what a successful life is. So this is the for formula for being blessed, a blessed man, a happy man, a successful man. Remember, Psalms 1, very first one. Stay away from bad company. Study, meditate. 
God's word. Stand for what is right. Father, we thank you for your word again that just speaks to us. Father, I pray that uh, your spirit is working in each one of us right now. Maybe showing us places to where we've become kind of a hollow, where we're portraying something that maybe we're not. Father, use your spirit to show us that. And Father, then give each one of us the the courage and also the strength to admit it. To bring whatever that is to you and that you feel that emptiness. Help us to be aware of the bad company that we hang around with that influences our lives. Give us hunger for your word and let that word just be humming in our minds throughout our activities throughout the day. And with that, giving us the strength then to stand for what is right. And you are what is right. I pray this for each one of us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.